good morning. It's good to see y'all. Hey, why don't y'all stand? Let's sing. Sing to the King. You guys ready? Here we go. the person next to you and say, gee, you look good this morning. <laughs> Y'all be seated. You look good too, Vince. Thank you, brother. You look good too. <laughs> would, I, would I say any different though? No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. How many people had a blessed week this week? Amen. I did too. It was a great week. It was great weather. And uh, I am glad we are almost to spring, and it'll be garden time pretty soon. So uh, if you have any garden tips for me, please let me know, because our garden stinks every year. We <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> uh, I'll ask uh, Tommy Wilson for his garden tips. They always do a fantastic <laughs> garden, Bar uh, Tommy and Barbara. So, <clears throat> um, Our scripture's from Luke, Luke 11, 9 through 13. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask of a fish, will he uh, give a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? We have a good Father, don't we? Amen. I want to tell you one little quick story about when I was a kid. I don't know how many people grew up in church, and if your church did this um, thing. Our church, uh, when I was a kid, it would when you were like four and five, it had this program, and it would give these little plaques if you got up in front of the church and you like said the Lord's Prayer or, or if you uh, could say the 23rd Psalm. Did, did anybody have churches that did that when you were kids, yep. have little programs? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so we'd get this neat little plaque we could put up on our wall. 
Well, when I was four years old, I, I was, you know, in this program, and I had to go up front and say the Lord's Prayer. Well, I had prayed every night with my, with my dad, and he would kneel by my bed. I hope I can get through this without <laughs> crying. Um, but anyways, so I was used to praying with my dad next to me. And so when I, it was my turn to get up in front of the church and to say the Lord's Prayer, my dad walks up with me, and he kneels in front of the church, and he puts one leg up and gets, kneels on one. And I, as a little boy, I put my arms on his leg, and I say the Lord's Prayer with my dad up there. And that really, that's the memory that I remember. Not that plaque, but my dad going up and doing that for me. Amen. We have such a more wonderful Heavenly Father Amen. that we so many times take for granted, that loves us and wants to give us good gifts and did something amazing by giving his son for us. When I think of how my dad loved me and how the father loved his son and gave his son for us, that gift you should just meditate on that from time to time and just really thank the Lord for the gift of salvation that he gave us. If you're young and, you, and your experience with your dad was not that way, I, my heart goes out to you. Seek a man who loves the Lord, yeah. who you can draw close to, that can be a father to you in this world. But most of all, seek the Heavenly Father. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the gift of salvation that was paid by your son Jesus on the cross. He's shed blood for us. And it covers us. It cleanses us. and makes us white as snow. And it's not because of anything good that we have done. It's all because of you, Jesus. And so we're thankful. We're thankful for the cross. We never want to lose the joy of our salvation, but we want to rejoice in that gift day after day. So today, as we enter into worship, I pray that our eyes would not be on ourselves, but our eyes would be on you, Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the faith to worship you and the gift of salvation. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vince. Y'all stand and sing this with me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your whole. Can we sing that much again? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Oh, bless the Lord. to see the, the dawn of the darkest day, the power of the cross. took the 
stand before you only because of what your son, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ did. Lord Jesus, your wounds, what you went through, the humiliation is ours. It's what we deserve. We just thank you, Lord, for your great love that you did this for us because of your wonderful love, because you care so much for us. We just want to be good, faithful servants of you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Who can satisfy my soul like you? me, refreshing me with life abundantly, river full of life, I'll you me, I will trust in you, I will trust in you, my God. Well, I tried. <laughs> Y'all be seated. <laughs> oh, it was okay. <laughs> they, they, we had a, they accused me of not sticking to the music, you understand? <laughs> we were having a bet going well over <laughs> whether Dave would repeat the chorus at the end, and nobody bet on what happens now, but that's okay. We watched a movie this week, uh, Jan and I, that quoted this passage, Isaiah chapter 40, and it's been stuck in my head since we watched that movie, especially with the events going on in the world right now. Um, this passage mentions the nations, and he's speaking 
to Israel, and it finishes the chapter with a beautiful promise, and he begins with something that sounds quite hopeless. He says in verse 17, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. And when we think of the situation that so many nations are going through right now, that doesn't sound like a very loving promise, but he reminds us of the promise that is given to us for those who wait in the Lord. It says in verse 29, well, we'll start in verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And of course, this promise is primarily to Israel, but I want to pray that over you today. I know that so many of you are struggling and hurting, and I feel that myself this week. I had trouble sleeping last night because of um, a lack of peace in my heart. And I pray with you guys, with empathy. And as we mention the prayer list today, um, I ask that you would join us in prayer this morning and throughout the week um, for people this week who may be having a rough week, um, but we can lift them up. I want to pray first for Carol Lindley. Carol um, is having knee replacement surgery tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. So if you're free at 10 o'clock in the morning, pray specifically uh, for Carol tomorrow. I ask that you please continue praying for Vanessa's dad. Vanessa's dad is still in the hospital, and um, in some ways he's gotten worse because they now um, have found that he has a bacterial infection. Um, Vanessa, on her Facebook page, has a GoFundMe. Um, if you feel called to give in any way to help with those medical um, burdens that they're going to be going through, just um, you can find that information on Vanessa's Facebook, but if you aren't called in that way, we're all called to pray. So be praying for Vanessa's dad. Continue praying for Dave's brother. Um, they're still looking for a rehab facility for him. He's still in the hospital. They still quite haven't found a fit for him. But Dave got off the phone with him earlier today, and he's looking better in some ways. They still have him on oxygen, but um, he's looking good. Continue praying for Don Stelzer's mom, and along with that, continue praying for Don. Uh, Don Stelzer's mom is having a biopsy on Friday, so they aren't exactly sure what they're going to find, but Don has been struggling a lot with caring for his mother, um, and that's why he's out today. He has, um, he's wore out, and he's sick because of the care that she's needing right now, so just be praying for Don's mother and for Don, and uh, I ask that you be praying for Lane Williams, his next soldier surgery, so his first one went great, and he's recovering well. His next one um, is going to be on the 17th of this month. So uh, be praying for Lane. And that's my whole list today. Um, whether we're talking about Carol or Vanessa's dad or Dave's brother or Don's mom or Lane, we have people who are hurting. And we used to do this all the time in this church, and I ask that we would do this again today. We used to, every service, have the men of the church come forward and pray at these altars. And it, in my opinion, was always a powerful moment. So if you feel called to do that today, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And if you want to come to these altars and specifically pray uh, for these names, I would ask that you join me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for who you are, God, that you keep all of your promises, God. And we just read in your word that you promise to those who would follow you that you will strengthen us and lift us up, God. I pray your compassion and mercy and grace upon us today. As we have stress and anxiety and as the valleys of this life have hit us, God, I just pray that we would turn to you, our rock and our shelter, our victorious warrior, God. We could never thank you enough, God, for all the ways that you bless us. And I just pray that your hand would be on the lives of these names that we've mentioned this morning. 
whether people in the hospital or looking forward to surgery, recovering from surgery, or those so many people who are caring for these people who we often forget to pray for, God. I just pray that you would give us strength, that you would mightily enact your will in our lives, God, and that we would give you all of the glory. We thank you for that precious blood shed for us, God, that gives us standing before you, God, that we can lift up a prayer to you, that the veil has been torn because of your son's sacrifice, God, and I just thank you for that. And I pray that as we continue to sing, as we fellowship together under the word, God, that, that you would be the forefront of our vision. Your grace, your mercy are the reason that we're here, God, and I just thank you for all that you give us. We love you and we thank you for all of this. In your son's name, amen. As these men continue. I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And Oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Just stand with me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, Lord, I need you.
defense. Yes. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Yeah. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do uh, thank you for this day, Heavenly Father. A time where we can come to your house, where we can uh, worship you, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we thank you for a country where we can still worship you in uh, freedom, Heavenly Father. Lord, there's so many places where this is not possible. Lord, we uh, know that you tell us to pray for our enemies, Heavenly Father. And Lord, uh, pray for the leaders, Heavenly Father. So we do this. Lift up our, all the leaders throughout the world, Heavenly Father, and pray for those that are uh, in uh, need, Heavenly Father. Lord, we are blessed in this country. Help us at this time to realize how much we are blessed, Lord, as we give back a portion of what you've given us. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you. It's all in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen.
just proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words All right, the kids are released for Children's Church. I already know that, so they're already on their way out. Um, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker, who I think is hiding behind me. And one of the first things I wanted to tell you is that he's a dangerous person to leave behind you because he's a double black belt in martial arts and he could kill you with his pinky finger if he really chose to. And so I'm not sure, but I trust that we're on camera, and so if he does kill me, at least he'll get caught. <laughs> right. Um, no, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Mario Melendez. Uh, Dr. Melendez came to join us at OBU um, in fall of 2021, um, fall of 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting time to join a university faculty when you're not allowed to visit with people and all distance and all that. And he's been a fantastic addition to OBU's faculty. Um, his wife, Becca, is with us this morning. Say hi, Becca. Yeah, there we go. And his parents are also here. Say hi, mom and dad. Yep. Um, so Dr. Melendez did his undergraduate work at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, and got his doctorate at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, which is conveniently and imaginatively located in the city of? New Orleans. New Orleans, yeah. It's shocking we have such imagination as Baptists. And now he teaches at Oklahoma Baptist University, another very imaginatively named university. Um, so please do join me in welcoming uh, preaching while RJ is on holidays, and uh, so we have the privilege of having Dr. Mario Melendez. It's an awkwardly tall microphone. <laughs> anyway, if you have your Bibles, meet me in Malachi chapter 1, Malachi chapter 1. Uh, I asked RJ, what would you like me to preach on? He said, you can preach on anything as long as it comes from the Old Testament. I think he knows my job. So I'm getting as close as I can to the New Testament without crossing the page. We're going to the book of Malachi. Book of Malachi chapter 1. Here's a question to pose to you as we start today. Here's the question. Does God care how we worship? Does God care how we worship? Uh, this semester, uh, I'm, I'm teaching through the prophetic literature, and so we're walking through all of the prophets of old, such as Joshua and Judges, and we just finished up, I think it was uh, Amos and Joel the other day, and so as we're walking through them, the constant banging gong, the banging sound, the banging confrontation of prophetic literature is this, that the prophets call out rightly our last priority, worship. At the heart of the social injustice cry of Malachi, the heart of the cry that justice might flow like rivers from Amos, at the heart of the unbalanced scales in Habakkuk, is the reality of this statement here, God cares how you worship. So meet me in Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read a little bit to set the context, to give you a... 30,000 foot view, and then we'll zoom in and examine the text for today. Meet me in verse 6 of chapter 1 in Malachi. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts? O priest, who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? I say, by polluting uh, offerings upon my altar. By, but how have we polluted this? By saying that the Lord's uh, uh, table might be despised when you offer blind animals in sacrifice. Is that not evil? 
When you offer lame or sick animals, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Would he accept and show favor to you? Says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he might be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, uh, he will show favor to any of you. Will he show favor to any of you? Sorry. The Lord of hosts asks, Oh, that there be one among you who would shut the doors that you may not kindle fire on my altar in vain. For I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. And I will not accept an offering from your hand. And here's the punchline of our passage for today. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, my name will be great among the nations. In every place, an incense will be offered to my name and pure offerings. For my name will be great among the nations, declares the Lord of hosts. The word of the Lord for the day. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. So, Father, we're keenly aware, as some have prayed and stated already, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that need you today in Eastern Europe. We beg and we plead and we invoke the word of the prophets that you would remove those from power, for that is your supreme power. But, Lord, watch our tongues. May we beg and plead for the salvation and grace of Vladimir Putin. For if it wasn't for you, that could be us. Lord, we beg and plead now that you, from your word, declare to us exactly what you want in regards to worship. This day we pray. Amen and amen. Um, if you're like me, you've been glued to the television watching all that's happening in Eastern Europe, right? Um, I've been to Russia. I went to Russia, and I think that was 2003 or 2004, one or the other. Three. Mom says three. Okay. 2003, I went to Russia. It's cold. Um, whenever I was there, it was negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit in the sunlight. I'm a Cajun French boy from South Louisiana. Just go ahead and guess. I don't like cold. Dad had to go and buy his first winter coat since he's moved up here. We don't like cold. It's crazy. But as you watch the news, you'll see noted all across Eastern Europe is this beautiful, strange architecture. Uh, remnants of the USSR having owned all of these foreign Baltic states, such as Latvia, Moldavia, all of the stands, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, etc. You all know what I'm talking about. Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine. And in all of this weird-looking architecture, there's this resounding truth, it's empty. Um, what, what's quite interesting about this, and my favorite one to look at, is what's called the Bulgarian Parliament Building. Or Bulgarian, sorry. Bulgarian Parliament Building. It's, it, it kind of looks like a spaceship, if we're going to be honest. It's quite cool looking. Um, but the Bulgarian Parliament Building, which was being built... Uh, and then was taken over by the USSR whenever they came to power. Uh, it never came to fruition of being a symbol, a place of the people. Instead, it got uh, changed and morphed by USSR uh, Soviet architects into what is now known as brutalist architecture. The irony of the parliament building is that which was for the people became so engrossed by the designer's desire that the people it was meant to represent and help were never represented or helped. Meet me in Malachi. We're in the 4th century. Coming back from Persia is the situation of our text. These people have come back and they are now reconstructing the temple because, of course, it got destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. Uh, go read that story over in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, but now they've come back into the land and they're building a temple, right? Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, as well as the book of Ezra covers this entire period. There's this very sad and strange verse in the book of Ezra, which is the historical situation of our prophet today. Ezra chapter 3 says this, But many of the priests... 
the Levites, the fathers of the families, who are now old men who remember the first house, cried with a loud voice. Now this is not a cry of joy that they're building the house of the Lord. This is a cry of sorrow. But, in verse 12 of Ezra 3, many shout aloud for joy. The result, chapter 13, verse 13, you could not distinguish between joyful shouting of the young and sorrowful cries of the old. I think our situation here in Malachi, in the church, puts it this way for us. Um, um, the temple's being reconstructed, uh, the temple's being built, services are being done, but here's the reality, it is built and constructed upon the personalities of those doing it. It's being built and constructed and being worshipped upon the personalities of those therein. By nature of connection, Malachi is making the same accusation toward the church. We have come to the point of brutalist, not only construction and architecture, but brutalist worship of our Lord. So I welcome you now to prophetic literature class. First thought that we need to gain from this chapter is this right here. See it in verse 6 with me. Remember his name. Remember his name. Verse 6 A son honors a father, a servant is master. If I am father, you might want to circle that if you like to mark in your Bible like I do. Father, where is my honor? If I am master, I would circle that one as well. Where is my fear? You have despised my name. Uh, If you grow up around a bunch of uh, Orthodox Jewish folk, as I have many friends that are Orthodox Jews... Um, you will quickly learn that they never say God or even Yahweh. Um, In fact, if you go to a Jewish deli, which I've got many friends that are Jewish deli owners, uh, they will put G-D on the sign. They will never spell out God fully. And then whenever they pray, they would say something along the lines of, Baruch Atah Adonai, blessed are the Lord. Or maybe Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed is the name They don't even remember the name Yahweh in their prayers. First thought that I have for you is remember his name. Why, Mario? Why? Because by nature of connectivity through hermeneutic here, we learn this truth that we also are worshiping our name more than his. I know this stings. Welcome to reading the Bible with Mario. So I don't know if you're like me or not, but uh, truth be told, most of the time it's about Mario. Fill in the blank with your name, yes? Throughout the week, day in, day out, you desire to hear your name invoked or said by those grandbabies, by students, by fellow workers, by other friends. You want to know that you are known, and that is contrary to what we are supposed to be doing. I'll step off the toes for a split second. His name should be our song. His name should be our focus. His name should be our mission. But if you don't know the name of Yahweh, are you really doing it? And some of you might be going, wait, what, Yahweh? What, what's that about? Um, here, let me, let me help you out. Jesus' name is not Jesus. That's Anglicanized English. Jesus' name is Yahshua which literally means Yahweh saves. So you need to understand that he is the divine supreme God here in our text before you turn the page, skip that blank page, and go over to Matthew. Behold Jesus, the son of David, rightful heir to the throne. 
If he's going to be the son of David, rightful heir to the throne, savior of the world, you need to know that he is Yahweh's son who can indeed save. He should be our song. He should be our focus. He should be our mission. But here's an accusation that I have of a lot of, dare I say, modern worship. How many times does it say I in the song? Now, we are supposed to sing songs of testimony. That's okay, right? Um, a pastor came in and I was sitting on the piano playing some hymns early because I got here early. And one that came to mind was, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Right? Y'all know it. That's a great song of testimony. But we need to praise more than testify in that sense. How do we get this, Mario? Exodus 9 starts this out. For this purpose I have raised you up, I have saved you, so that I might be able to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. So whenever I talk to my Jewish friends, we have great Hebrew conversations about Old Testament and whatnot, I always have this one accusation against them. Literally at the beginning of the story of Exodus, God says, declare my name, and you won't even say it to your family. Um, this is why we pray in Jesus' name. Because we don't shy away from the truth of who God is and what he has done in our lives. But my Orthodox friends shy away from that. In fact, some of them are ashamed of who God is. Micah 4, 5, another parallel passage. Micah was uh, back in the uh, 8th century. He puts it this way to us. All the nations may walk in the name of their God, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever, declares the righteous. How do you handle this? The Lord our God. The Lord beside you. None rule over us. So we declare your name and your honor, Isaiah 26. In case you're curious where Jesus got the idea of the... There we go, I'll move my mic down. In case you're curious where Jesus got the idea of the Lord's Prayer, it's right here. So yes, I'm preaching the New Testament by preaching the Old Testament. It starts out, Our Father. Jesus, where'd you get that idea? Right here. So whenever Jesus says, pray something like this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus, through rabbinical tradition, is invoking the entirety of this passage and saying, know this, you need to know his name, you need to honor him, and you need to give him full due, otherwise just nail the door shut. I always joked with my wife that if we had a son, I would want to name him Malachi, and I would have him memorize and repeat to me all the time verse 10. Oh, that one among you would shut the doors to the church. Because I'm telling you right now, we have a bunch of churches throughout this world that the Lord would probably be blessed if we nailed the door shut. Let's get real. What happened to all the churches in the book of Revelation? Well, it makes us think that we're any different. Doors should be nailed shut if we don't understand who he is. Hebrews 2.12 leads us a little bit further. I will declare your name to my brothers, my sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. So why do we sing what we sing? Why do we have these hymn books and these new songs? Why are we constantly doing what we do? It's because the name of the Lord is a strong tower that we sing to others. By the way, you are not going to beat the Methodist to Piccadilly. <laughs> if you don't know what Piccadilly is, let's just say, I don't know, Burger King. Worship that isn't based on the personhood of God sadly finds us at the center of worship. 
This is why I encourage everybody, the older you get, the deeper you should grow into reading, studying, and knowing the doctrines of the faith. But instead, sadly, most people, as they age in the faith, I'm jumping on toes, I don't care. They get smaller books mailed to them, not bigger ones. If I came up to a senior saint, I should be able to ask you, can you explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity from Scripture and throughout church history? And you should be able to do it. But sadly, as we're walking with the Lord... The truth of the matter is, is that most of us take two steps in our life, and that's about it. Malachi's calling us to this reality. Second thought here, remember his name, now remember his worship. Meet me in verse 9. Verse 9 of Malachi 1. So now entreat the favor of God that he might be gracious to us. So Mario, does God care how we worship? Oh yes, He does. And right here we see from Malachi that our worship needs to be uh, graceful. Our worship needs to be grace yielding. Our worship needs to be grace resulting. You should walk away from church going, Ooh, the Lord is gracious to me. Mm. I don't deserve that. But instead, we end up having a lot of services built to ourselves, and the result is this. I feel good walking out of church. No, 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 no. When you meet the holiness of the Lord, you should pull in Isaiah chapter 6 and fall flat on your face. But instead, we dance out of here as though we just went to Chuck E. Cheese. Do you understand the grace of the Lord? Hebrews 4, let us approach the throne in grace. One of my students the other day asked me, said, uh, Dr. Mario, what, what's your favorite sermons to preach? And I said, my favorite sermon services to preach are always Ash Wednesday, uh, I'm a New Orleans boy, and uh, Good Friday. They were like, those are your favorite sermons to preach? Yes, every year, love them. I'm weeping inside because we didn't have an Ash Wednesday service to go to this week. The reason that I, I, I cherish Ash Wednesday and Good Friday is this. Our church calendar points us to the reality that we need to reflect on the grace of God. You know this great song of the faith, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. What's the next line? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace should be the reason you walk through those doors. Grace should be the reason you walk out those doors. Grace is the reason your little ticker keeps on ticking. Back here in Malachi chapter 1, they forgot the Lord's name, and as a result, they forgot the grace of the God that saved them, not only from Pharaoh, not only from Assyria, not only from Babylon, now they've been delivered from Persia, and still they show up and they have forgotten God's grace. May we never do that. The moment you forget God's grace... I hope that's the moment the Lord calls you home. Because you will then lead a life that is not representative of the Christ. 1 Peter 4.12 says it this way, We are stewards of God's grace. Stewards of God's grace. I like to tease it out this way in class. You have grace to breathe. You have grace to know the Lord. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was our, our beautiful deacon that mentioned it in the prayer. Lord, we get to worship freely in this country. That's grace. Uh, steward of grace. Grace to enter into a church. I've been to underground churches in other countries where they fear walking into an arena walking into a room because they don't know if the KGB, if the underground police, whatever, are going to capture them and shoot them and kill them that day. Grace of the Lord allowed you to walk into this room. Grace of the Lord allows us to live daily. By God's grace, I live daily. By God's grace, I die daily if you go to the Apostle Paul. By God's grace, I stand before you now and share with you 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Mario, I, I know grace. I, I get grace in my life. Then let's check ourselves real quick. This is going to hurt. How many of you foolishly like me have uttered a prayer this week? Lord, I wish somebody would just kill Putin. Let me testify, both hands. Anybody with me? Let's get real. I have friends that work in the CIA and other things like that, and I just I said it to my mom the other day. I was like, I wish somebody would just push Malcolm out the window of an airplane and tell him to take care of business. He'd do it. Lest we forget this reality, the Apostle Paul was a Middle Eastern terrorist. How do you get to that point, Mario? Well, he's a radical religious man from the Middle East who kills Christians. That qualifies as terrorist in my book. And yet he ends up writing some 50, maybe 60% of your New Testament. Grace. If you know who God is and you know the grace that God has shown you, the outcry this week with the war going on in, in Ukraine should be, Lord, show grace. Uh, whenever you go to a Catholic service, and I've been to a lot of Catholic services growing up, uh, uh, they will say the prayer request kind of like what Andy did for y'all earlier. We pray for Mrs. So-and-so, brother such-and-such. And then the congregation will always cry out in response at a Catholic service, Lord, have mercy. Or, Lord, show grace. Does God care how we worship? Oh, yes. Remember his name. Remember his worship. Last thing here from Malachi 1. Remember his mission. Meet me in 11, verse 11. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations in every place. In essence, there will be offered up. Incense will be offered up there. To my name, a pure offering for my name will be great. Do you think he's just like having a stutter moment all of a sudden? My name, my name, my name, my name. Do you think God stutters? So then that means this is intentional, yes? So then why do we continue to worry about our names over his? If suddenly the name of temple was not on the outside, would it wreck you? It shouldn't. Because it's his name that matters, not ours. We see this here. How do we do this? How do we remember his mission, Mario? Let me give you a few things to think of. Number one, praise him every day. Um, praise him in every prayer. Uh, my Jewish friends, I love it. They always start out every single prayer with Baruch. Blessed are you, Lord. They praise him at the beginning of every prayer and at the end of every prayer. We tend to wait till the end whenever we go, and in Jesus' name. It's kind of like a caveat in our prayer life, let's be honest. An addendum added on. In every prayer. Praise Him in every offering. Praise Him in every nation. Isaiah 25 puts it this way for us as we slide into wrapping this up. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for it. In perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. It's a tough pill to swallow to turn on the television and see mothers around dead babies, to see missile strikes hitting. It's a tough thing to turn whenever we look in history and see the millions of bodies piled up in Nazi Germany to see Paul Pot, to go to Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, 
to see the thousands of Marines dead in the Baton Death March. Those are very difficult things to see, and that's what I show whenever I teach prophetic literature, because right here Isaiah put it well. Lord, you planned this for your name's sake, so the nations might know. Psalm 42, a psalm of David. Why, my soul, are you downcast? We have many great hymns that have taken that line from David. Why are you disturbed within? Let me jump on your toes one last time. Because sadly, we've redefined Christianity. If we redefine Christianity, as has happened in the last 30, 40, beyond that years, we're giving into a temptation to do exactly what they were doing in the 4th century of Malachi. Building up things to ourselves, and the young don't know any better. Some of us need a good granny that says, hey... I, I, I enjoy your stuff, but don't forget, baby. Don't forget. What does it look like when we redefine Christianity? It looks like this. Suddenly, Jesus is a middle-class American who cares more about America than other countries. That's a fourth-century belief. They, they, they thought God only cared about Israel, having just been liberated from Persia. Uh, If we redefine Christianity, it's a Jesus that doesn't mind us being materialistic. If we redefine Christianity, it means that Jesus doesn't expect us to forsake our all at the drop of a hat if he asks it of us. If we redefine Christianity, this is going to be a Jesus that is fine with your nominal devoted life when he is Lord over 9 a.m. to noon or later whenever I'm long-winded. If we redefine Christianity, it results in a Jesus who doesn't want us to go to the extreme for those that are in need. The result, if we redefine Christianity, is this. When we gather together in our church buildings and sing and lift up our hands in worship, most of the time these days... We're not actually worshiping Jesus of the Bible. We're worshiping Jesus who looks like us. So again, does God care how we worship? Remember his name. Remember his worship. Remember his mission. Because if you don't understand who God is, you can't fulfill the great commandment. Of go therefore and make disciples. John Piper puts it quite well in his book that's entitled Let the Nations Rejoice. Piper puts it this way Missions exist because worship does not. Our objective in being missionaries and sharing the gospel and being evangelistic is so that people might worship the Lord. And as a result, the world will change. You know what we need to be praying for desperately? We need to be praying desperately for pastors that live in Moscow to somehow have a holy moment conversation with Vladimir Putin for him to meet the risen Christ, for him then to say, I pull back my troops and I'm going to bless a nation instead because the Lord just showed me grace. But if we forget the grace shown to us by our sovereign Lord, we will never get to that point of being able to pray for our enemies. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Romans chapter 12. So how do we respond to this? I done stepped all over your toes, muddied up your nice shoes. How do we respond to this, Mario? Here you go. Come through these doors with reverence of grace given to you to walk through them. Some of the great things that we grew up seeing back home in New Orleans and all around that area is these beautiful cathedrals. 
Whenever you walk into a cathedral or an Orthodox church or whatever the case is, one of the beautiful things of it is, is when you walk through those doors, suddenly even the three-year-old goes, oh. Right worship begins with a gasp. The Lord is gracious. And He is here. And once you walk through these doors, how do we apply this text, Mario? I, I call you to do this. Practice Bible reading. Practice Bible preaching. Practice Bible praying. Practice Bible singing. Practice biblical observance of the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper. Because the grace of the Lord is upon you. As the people come to lead us in worship, I'm going to pray over you. I like that you have altars here. So I invite you, if that's your bodily way of responding to the Lord, if it's not and it's just going to be there in your chair, that's great. You can bow in your heart perfectly fine, and some people, as you age, knees don't bend as well. That's all right. But your heart still can bend. Here's what I call you to as we sing this song. Beg for forgiveness of the times that you don't come into this place knowing the grace of the Lord. Beg for the forgiveness of the times that you want your name to be invoked rather than his. And then as a result of that, beg that the Lord will give you the opportunity to declare how good and merciful and just my Jesus is. Pray with me. So, Father God, this is the text for the day. First Sunday of Lent, we come before you recognizing that our humanity is nothing but dust and we will return to dust. Therefore, you who live forever are pr supreme, the focus, the principal reason that we gather today. God, Forgive us of the times that we are selfish about ourselves and forget that everything is for your name and your glory among the nations. Indeed, Father, we pray desperately, Lord, don't send a spy, send an evangelistic pastor to Vladimir Putin. May he be wooed by the Spirit and confronted with his sinfulness. For there is grace at the cross of Christ. We pray these things and respond now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you